Well, we want to um, pick up our discussion where we left off last time. We were talking about the bank and its sources and uses of funds. Just the typical bank. If you remember, I said banks gather funds from three places. The first is deposits. And this is not only first, but it is the most important source of funds for banks. We talked about the transaction deposits. And transaction deposits are just, that's a more generic term for checking deposits. Okay, these are deposits that once you put the money in the bank, you can go out and conduct transactions. And you can do that by writing a check, using your debit card, or using an ATM card and getting cash someplace. And we talked about two types of transaction deposits, demand deposit and a now account. Banks seldom, eh, sometimes they do, but banks seldom call their accounts demand deposit or now account. They usually have some name for it. They might have two or three different demand deposits. One is uh, easy saver checking account for college students or what, you know, I mean, they can just give a name to this and they can have like a minimum balance requirement and a monthly service fee and so many uh, checks are free, like the, you know, 100 free checks a year or something like this. Whatever they want, they can market this product how they want. Okay? The same things for a now account. The legal difference between the two is there is no interest on a demand deposit and there is interest on a checking account, or at least it is legal. They could set that interest rate at zero percent, but usually they're going to pay something, a tenth of a percent, or a half a percent, or two percent, or six percent, or whatever. Usually it'll be positive. And the time this is really important is when we have inflationary times. That's when interest rates are high. And during high inflation, interest rates are high, and then we're going to see the now accounts paying three percent, five percent, eight percent, and demand deposits nothing. I told you the other legal difference is this, is that technically bank, uh, businesses must have demand deposits, not now accounts. But I told you then about the repurchase agreements to get around this no interest deal. Anyway, we talked about those last time. And then we talked about the non-transaction accounts at banks, deposits, I should say, at banks. The non-transaction deposits, a common term we would have would just be, oh, that's a savings account. And what we think of with savings account is you don't really write a check, you don't really spend it, and you get more interest. And that's not a bad way of looking at it. I'm going to go back and talk about the details here in a second. Somebody stopped by after class last time and said, so are the checking accounts, the transaction accounts, are those the more important accounts? These are the ones that are more common. If we ask students, you know, how many of you have a checking account, pretty much everybody's going to raise their hands. Okay, and uh, how many of you have savings accounts? Not so many. And you may say, well, I have a small savings account. It's got $200 in it. Not a big deal. And that would probably be true for students. But if we ask for the United States as a whole, then what we're going to find out is however much is in transaction accounts, and I think I gave a number like $700 billion last time, there will be several trillion. Let's see if I have a recent number here. This is going to be in the neighborhood of $6 trillion for all the non-transaction accounts. And there are different kinds of non-transaction accounts. But it's not 10 times as much, but it's like eight times as much. Okay, and we talked about a few of these last time, and I'm going to go ahead and extend that discussion. I talked about the passbook savings accounts. Passbook savings accounts, usually no minimum denomination, usually no maturity date. I talked about the money market deposit account, I believe. Not really much different than a passbook savings account in the sense that there is no maturity date on it. The difference would be you do have a checkbook, but that checkbook, you're only permitted to write a limited number of checks a month. And 
for most people, and it's not just checks, but any kind of transaction, if you use the debit card or something like that, I believe they are limited to six transactions a month with these accounts. And so for most people, that's not going to be enough transactions to, for that to be your main checking account. And so it's mainly a more liquid kind of a savings account. What it would be more useful for is if you just say, you know, I want some money that's earning interest, but if something would come up, I'd want to be able to transfer dollars out of this account to, I don't know, to a mutual fund or into my checking account or maybe make a house payment if I needed to, but I want to be able to transfer some money kind of easily with this, but I'm not going to be using it all the time for that purpose. Okay. Next, time deposits. time deposits, and CDs. And the CD is not the compact disc that we play music on. Certificate of deposit. And there's really not much difference between, uh, there's no real significant difference, nothing meaningful. With the certificate of deposit, you get a piece of paper. And this piece of paper is your agreement with the bank and it says something like this, oh, I've put, I don't know, $1,000 in the bank, and the interest rate is written down there, 4% or 6 or 2.75 or whatever you and the banker agree on, and then there's a maturity date, like uh, three years hence. Although they don't write three years hence. Whatever the date is, you get that, it would be three years from then. By the way, this kind of looks like a bond, doesn't it? Right? With the bond, there would be a par value or face value or maturity value. There would be a coupon interest rate and there would be a maturity date. Huh. So this is a little bit like a bank issuing a bond, although it's not a bond because bonds can be traded out there in secondary markets. It is not that. But it's the same general idea. And so that would be the certificate. If you just came to the bank and said, oh, what are you paying for a three-year deposit? And they told you some rate, and you give them the money, and there's not a certificates and stuff like that filled out. But still, they'd put that in their computer. And then every month or quarter, whenever they credit interest, then it'd be at a 4% rate or whatever you agreed on. It'd be more or less the same thing. Yes, sir? You can use uh, CDs as collateral, can't you? You can. Uh, for a loan, like you'd come in and say something like, I want to borrow money, I want to borrow $25,000 to buy a car, and then you, and I mean, I think this is not done all that much, but you can say then, oh, I've got money in this CD, and I'll leave that there, you know, I promise not to come in and take it out, and they'll, you can promise, but they know you're not going to come take it out because they won't give it to you. Right, because they've got a deal in their computer. But anyway, and then they would give you the loan at a little bit lower interest rate because you've got your money locked up there. So, yeah, you can do that. I think that's not all that common. I think I had one loan that way from a credit union, not a bank, before. And then afterwards, I wasn't sure if I was doing the right thing. Why didn't I just take the money out of my savings account, my time deposit, and pay for the car or whatever? And then you compare those interest rates and you go, oh, I'm getting let's say 4% on this deposit, and I'm paying six, huh, maybe I should have just taken that money and, uh, you know, so you always have those issues. Anyway, here's how bankers will do at this point, and regulators keep track of it this way too. They talk about small and large CDs and time deposits. By the way, this is where the big bucks are. I was telling you about how this is like six trillion bucks for all of these non-transaction accounts. For the um, passbook savings accounts, we're talking of a few hundred, hundred billion dollars, another few hundred billion dollars. This would be, and I'm just going to put a number out there, maybe four and a half trillion dollars. I'll put a question mark there because I don't want you thinking that's exact, but this is where most of those dollars are in, in the non-transaction accounts. They're in time deposits. 
And technically speaking, a CD even is a time deposit because the idea is you've put it there and you've agreed to leave it a certain amount of time. You can get money out of these accounts early, but usually there is a penalty for early withdrawal. So the whole idea here is you've committed that for a certain amount of time. And so non-transaction accounts, a more general term would be savings and time deposits. And so here's the savings deposits up here with no maturity date, and then here are the time deposits with a maturity date. And this is where there's a bundle of money. And I said a while ago, if I asked you all or just students across campus to raise your hands, do you have a bank account? Yeah, how many have a checking account? Everybody's hand goes up. How many have a savings account? A smaller number of hands goes up. Guess what? People who are retirees or nearing retirement, virtually all of them have these kinds of accounts. Right? And so there are segments of America that have lots and lots of money in these time deposits. And then there are other segments of America that have very little or none. I mean, maybe most of you, if I say, do you have a non-transaction, a savings type account? Yeah, but it's probably this kind. How many of you have money in a time deposit where it's committed for, you know, six months or two years or whatever? And probably it's a small percent. Not probably. These are pretty well known. You know, we know these surveys or have taken surveys. So anyway, small and large. The distinction's at $100,000. So large would be $100,000 and up. And then small would be less than $100,000. Now, there's two reasons for this, and really it boils down to one. Do you remember last time I was telling you about Regulation Q that sets a maximum interest rate on demand deposits at 0%? Regulation Q sets interest rate ceilings on deposits, or at least some. Well, back when Regulation Q was on one account after another, Regulation Q did not apply to large time deposits and CDs. It said basically this, even though we've set this maximum interest rate at three or three and a half or four or four and a half, depending on the account, we have no maximum on these large accounts, $100,000 or more. Why? And here's the underlying issue. The assumption is that anybody with $100,000 and up, and some of these have millions of dollars, the assumption is that people who have large amounts of money to put into these time deposits are sophisticated investors. And if we said, there is a law, we're not going to pay you more than 4%, they'd say, okay. And if they say, oh, not more than 4%, any place in America, we'll send it to Europe. We'll send it to Japan. We'll send that money to another country if we have to. We're going to get more than 4%. And so the feeling is that these are more sophisticated investors, and if we try and keep their interest rate down, they will escape those regulations. Okay? Now, I have no doubts whether that's true, but it's, if I go back and I think about Regulation Q, is this a good policy or bad? To me, there's something fundamentally unfair about it if you just say, well, you know, these people can escape Regulation Q. Let's just say if you've got $10,000 in a savings account, we will not let the banker pay you more than 5%. But if you've got $100,000, you and the banker can just work out any rate because we know you can escape this interest rate ceiling. Well, huh, would we do that with any other law? Would we say, you know, Certain people are more likely to get away with murder than others. So the law against murder, that doesn't apply to those people. Or speeding. Now, these people have radar detectors in their cars. They're more likely to get by with it. So the speed limit doesn't apply to them. And so the way, I mean, it's absolutely true that these people can take their money and leave the country with it. But is it fair to just say, well, you know, we're not going to let the bank pay you more than 5% if you have a small deposit. If you have a big deposit, you and the bank can work out anything. If it's 10%, 15%, and those rates were 10 or 15% back in the late 70s, early 80s. So is that fair? And I think probably not. I don't think probably. I think it is not fair. Now, fairness doesn't count to a lot of people. And so 
that can be discounted. But anyway, the point is that regulation, Q, uh, regulation Q applied. There were no now accounts during this period that we're talking about. There were demand deposits, passbook savings accounts. There were no MMDA accounts. These were, these came along when? I think I mentioned to you, 1982, Garn St. Germain. Remember that? That's when these came along. So before 1982, there were demand deposits, there were passbook savings accounts, there were small time deposits and large time deposits. And with everything except for large time deposits, Regulation Q set a ceiling, a maximum on interest rates. Okay, and then along in 1982, I'm going to say November, could have been October, then we got these money market deposit accounts and we got the now accounts. They called them now account and super now account back then. Super now, that, that sounds great. Anyway, and that's when we basically moved in this direction of deregulating, phasing out Regulation Q. Okay. Now, we no longer have Regulation Q problems or issues here, no fairness, unfairness. We still have a division between small and large deposits and keeping track of these dollars and the reason, you know, or, or reporting them and so forth. And the reason for that is it is true that the people, people and companies and small governments and so forth, you know, city governments, county governments, anybody with more than $100,000, they are more sophisticated investors. They are willing to go further to get a better deal. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as jumbo CDs, but people with these larger amounts of money will go, they behave differently not because they are different inside or genetically different or anything like that, but they have an incentive. If you've got $10,000 in the bank and you can get an extra 1%, you say, oh, $10,000, I get an extra 1%, hooray! How much is 1%? $100 a year. Less than $2 a week. Now, how much effort do you go to for less than $2 a week? Not much. But if somebody's got a million dollars, an extra 1%, that's $10,000. Huh, if I can get an extra 10,000 bucks, that's worth my getting out, shopping around, finding out what bank's paying the most, finding out if I could send my money to Toronto or to London and get a little bit extra interest. That's worth it. I'm shopping around now. And so, and by the way, you recognize that this money is sent electronically, so London is no further away than... I like to say Paducah, Kentucky, so let me say that. London is no further away electronically than Paducah, Kentucky, so if you've got a million bucks, you just shop around, find the best rate, and boom, it's there. Right? Two seconds later, the deal's done. And so anyway, these are more sophisticated investors. They behave differently, and so the Federal Reserve tells bankers to report these numbers separately. How much do you have in large CDs? How much do you have in small CDs? Okay, so anyway. Now, having said all that, Within each one of these categories of small and large CDs, what you're going to find here, I think, with the small CDs is any place from three months to three years would be very typical. It's not a limitation, though. That's between you and your banker. The banker comes up with one of these CDs, and it's just got a bunch of blank places in it. And you and the banker sit down, and the banker says, oh, how much money do you have? What are you looking for? How long would you like to tie this up? Blah, blah, blah. A little bit of discussion goes on. And then that's when the banker writes down the details. $5,000, we're going to pay you 4.5%. And then uh, three years from today, three years hence. So it's blank. And so if you came into the banker and said, I want to leave and I want this to be for six years, four months, six years, four months, that's a deal. Or four years and six months, or just whatever you want. The bankers take a money, right? That's what banks do. Money in, dollars out. And they'll take it however they can get it. If you want to give it to them for a week, yeah, they'll take it. Okay, so anyway, and then what they do is the rate they pay you kind of depends on how long you want to leave that. You remember about that positively sloped yield curve? The longer you want to leave that money, the more they'll pay you, generally. Okay? So anyway, but by far the most common term for 
uh, these small CDs and time deposits, less than $100,000, be from a few months up to a few years. These large CDs, this is more often money from sophisticated investors, and usually these sophisticated investors don't want to tie their funds up very long, so for them it would be more like 1 to 12 months would be much more common. Again, no restrictions on that, they'd just be more common. Now, you may not know, but the city government here and other city governments or county governments, they're buying these things all the time. They do something like this. They say, hey, look, it's the end of the year. People pay their property taxes, let's say. We've got, we'll say, $100 million coming in for property taxes. We're going to spend that money to pay employees and fix the roads and things like that over the next year. But here it is at the end of the year and we've got $100 million. We ought to earn some interest on that for a while until it is time. You know, we're not going to spend some of that until next December. And so what they'll do is take some of this, they'll call up their local bank, maybe the bank, you know, 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away, but they'll start shopping around. What kind of an interest rate can we get on some of these large CDs? We've got 100 million bucks. Be smart to move it, uh, to divide it up, right? About diversification of risk, don't give it all to one bank. Unless, like, you're the mayor and the banker's your brother or something like that. That'd be totally different and illegal. But, but things like that happen. Anyway, uh, so what you do is you say, we got some money here, and if you're going to spend $100 million over the next 12 months, that's about $8 million a month, a little bit more. So why don't we buy a series of these large CDs? And then it may be that the city charter, the rules, tell the local government and you know, the, um, it depends on what kind of government you have, who your authorities are, but you might have a local treasurer. But there may be rules say don't put more than $1 million with any one bank. There may be a rule that says we want at least 25% of this to go to local banks. There are different rules. But anyway, so governments are doing this. Companies do it. Let's say you've got a company and you say, oh, uh, uh, we just had some profits, we've been selling things, we've got profits, we've got $20 million in profits. We're going to buy some new delivery trucks two months from now. So we get this $20 million bucks now, we're going to buy some delivery trucks. They're going to cost, uh, I don't know, $5 million. Let's take our profits, our $20 million, and put $5 million of it into CDs, and we'll just lock this money up for two months. And then two months from now, those CDs will mature. The bankers will give us our money back. We've earned some interest for those two months, and now we'll go out and pay for those trucks. We've already got plans. Or there may be a construction project. We're building a new factory, and so we've got a schedule. We've got a contract, scheduled payment dates to our contractor. So what we'll do is we'll take this money and basically put it into a series of CDs, and those CDs will come due the day before we owe the money to the contractor under the schedule. Okay, so anyway, any number of things. And the people who buy bonds would be a person who might buy one of these. The issue, the, the big difference between one of these and a bond is the bond is, uh, you can, it's marketable is the terminology. You can sell a bond in secondary markets and turn that into cash anytime you want. But if somebody just says, I don't really need to turn this into cash. Let's say you're a wealthy person. You got a million bucks and you got money coming in each month from, uh, well, I don't even know. Maybe you own part of a business and things like this. And so you've got money coming in. You're a wealthy person. You might just say, eh, I'm going to lock this up. Let it work for six months and then I'll just see what I want to do at that point. And I don't need liquidity. I can wait six months. I'm not going to trade this. And so then go out and get one of these large CDs. But I'm saying that people and companies and governments that are more sophisticated tend to not want to commit this money for a long period of time because they want to keep their options open. Those options are more valuable if you have a lot of money. Okay. So anyway, I started to say, but let me see if I have any numbers. I'm going to say this that 
I put this number down like maybe we have four and a half trillion dollars, ballpark number of time deposits. I'm going to say that that is a ratio of about three to one with small versus large CDs. And by the way, I don't necessarily mean it's three to one on your unsophisticated investors. Let's say you had $150,000. If you had $150,000, you might not, probably would not go down and buy a large CD. You're sophisticated, you got plenty of money to do it, but probably you say, you know, I don't want to put it all with one bank. I don't want to commit it all for one term. If it's three months, six months, whatever. I think I'm going to divide this up. I'm going to have five CDs, each $30,000, right? And I'd like some of it three months, some six, some 12, some 18, some 24. And so now you have a series of small CDs, even though you have a large amount of money and you're, quote, a sophisticated investor. But anyway, so most of these time deposits are going to be um, uh, in the category of small time deposits. What sometimes happens, and especially, but I mean, I don't want to let on like 100% of the time, but fairly frequently when we're talking about large CDs is we get a negotiable CD. And a negotiable CD is not just a CD, but it can be sold in secondary markets. If you've got this CD, you can find another investor and sell it to them. And that requires for it to be a negotiable CD. There has, there's other paperwork that's got to be done. And also, if you're going to have a negotiable CD, you want to be able to, I mean, the reason, if you're putting money into a CD, the reason you want it to be negotiable is maybe you want cash. You want that to be liquid. You want it to be desirable out there. So probably you wouldn't go to the Third National Bank of Paducah, Kentucky, and say, here, give me a negotiable CD, because then you think, you know, if I need some money down the road, and I say, hey, who wants to buy it? People say, Paducah, Kentucky, what's that mean? And so much more likely, if you want a negotiable CD, you go to a big bank, a Bank of America, a Citibank, some bank of this nature and say, I want a negotiable CD. And then, if you need to sell that later on, you're the investor, you want to sell that later on, you can find a, a market for it. There are people out there go, yeah, I heard of that bank. I'll buy that from you. Okay? So anyway, usually, you do not have negotiable CDs that are smaller, uh, smaller than $100,000. It's possible, theoretically possible, but we get to a point where the paperwork makes it, you know, the cost of the paperwork and the other compliance, uh, the regulations and so forth, just make it where that's not a worthwhile thing to do. Okay, and also if you want that liquidity, you can always go out and buy a treasury bill, something that the government issues, and then you can trade that anyway. So anyway, usually we don't see those small negotiable CDs, although in theory you could. So have I got you adequately confused? Good, because, you know, that's what it's all about. I am going to say this is about 60% of all the money coming into banks. Ballpark figure, about 60%. About 15 to 20%. It's got to be more than that. Let me see if what my notes say here. Yeah, I'm going to say about 25%. About 25%, or maybe a little bit more. Each one of these could be a little more. 60% or a little more. 25% or a little more. This is borrowing. Where the banks are borrowing money. All of this money, well, not the third one, but the deposits are coming in, it's other people's money. The bank says to other people, give us money. And here the bank says to other people, give us money. Here's the difference. The relationship between the bank and these other groups. This is a deposit. You can spend it 
We're promising you interest and so forth. You have deposit insurance. We haven't really talked about that much. But here, the borrowing, the bank is going out and basically borrowing money, going out and saying, hey, would you make a loan to me? And they're signing some document, very often not always providing collateral. There's no deposit insurance and so forth. So let's talk about some of this borrowing from other banks. The terminology that is used here is purchasing Fed funds. So this banker says, I need some dollars, some bucks. I'm going to go to another bank and I am going to purchase Fed funds. Now, why the term Fed funds? There's some other bank over here. We're talking about the bank that needs funds and is borrowing those funds. But there is some other bank over here that says, hey, I got some money. It's not being used. I wish I could earn some interest. I'll lend it to that bank. And this bank is selling Fed funds. Okay. The bank that is purchasing Fed funds they're getting a special kind of loan. This is a one day, sometimes it's said overnight, loan. The dollars are on the books of the Fed, and that's what I started to say here a moment ago, is we call these Fed funds because the dollars are at the Fed. The bank that's doing the lending doesn't throw a million bucks into a station wagon and drive it across town and go, here you go, here's for that money you want to borrow. That money is deposited at the Federal Reserve. So the bank that's doing the lending has the money at the Fed, and the bank that's doing the borrowing, purchasing Fed funds, say, hey, we want to purchase Fed funds. And so the bank that's doing the lending, they tell the Federal Reserve, they've got a, a, a Fed wire, a network, sort of like the internet, but they send the signal to the Federal Reserve, transfer some money out of our account at the Fed into this bank's account at the Fed. And then these are unsecured loans, meaning no collateral. One day loans. Usually, in theory, this can be any amount of money. It could be one dollar. Usually what we get into is larger transactions, certainly with large banks. You know, we talked about the different kinds of banks, money center banks, regional banks, community banks. Very often what will happen is there will be some large bank in your state, maybe not a money center bank, but a large regional bank. Could be a money center bank. And then that large bank will say to the community banks in their town or in their state, in their region, the large bank may say, hey, if you ever have any just dollars sloshing around there, not earning any interest, and you wish you could put those dollars to work, well, then any time you want, you can sell those dollars, sell Fed funds, loan them to us, and we'll purchase those Fed funds, and we'll pay you interest. And we will take those dollars for one day at a time, and so you're getting interest. And by the way, if the interest rate were, let's say, 4%, then a one-day loan would be 4% divided by 365. That would be the interest rate, and that's a pretty low rate. But if you're sitting around over here, maybe somebody comes in, you've got a small bank, somebody puts $100,000 on the counter and slides across, say, put that in my account. And so you're the banker, you say, okay, and you take that $100,000. Now you say, oops, what are we going to do? Got $100,000, I'm paying interest to my depositor. I don't have a great place to loan that out. What you can do is 
first of all, get it to the Fed, get it in your account there, and then what you can do is you call up a regional bank or a money center bank and just say, hey, you want to purchase Fed funds? And they'll say, sure. And then you transfer that to them, and you're not tying your money up for any lengthy period of time, one day at a time. And you're getting a little bit of interest on it. Normally what will happen is these are one-day loans, but we roll those over one day after another. And so this bank, and you know, it's, I'm explaining it to you sort of in this sort of elementary way, and perhaps you haven't been involved in this, but these banks are involved in this every day, and so there's nobody explaining it, and they'll say something like, oh, I know that bank will purchase Fed funds from me. I know it. It's not like I have to start looking. And so I know that bank will do it. Not only do I know it because that's just their instinct to do this, I know it because I have a relationship with that bank. I've been selling Fed funds to them for years. So I know they'll do this. And then I know we can roll it over. I don't have to call them up and say, now, do you want me to leave that at another day or do you want to give it back? They have this understanding. And so this money's just being rolled over. I sell Fed funds for one day. That is our legal agreement. And then if we don't have any conversation tomorrow, it stays there. And if we don't do any more, it just stays there and rolls over one day after another. If it rolls 365 times, 4% interest got paid. But it's just rolling until finally I decide, if I decide two weeks from Tuesday, I want that money back, then I just tell that banker that I sold the Fed funds to, tomorrow I want that back. And they go, okay. And so tomorrow, they put that on their to-do list, and tomorrow they notify the Federal Reserve to send that back to your account at the Fed. This is going on every day. Every bank is not doing this every day, but most banks are involved in a Fed funds transaction every day. Most banks are. And some banks on both sides. That is to say, some banks may be a regional bank in, oh, I don't know, Kansas City or Memphis or something like this. They might be purchasing Fed funds from smaller banks in that area, and then they might be selling Fed funds to some bank in Chicago or New York. So banks are buying and selling Fed funds all the time. And these are just one-day deals. No security, no collateral. And that means you should know who you're doing business with. Okay? And it just keeps on rolling. There is an interest rate. What's the interest rate called? The Fed funds rate. Duh. And this is just determined by supply and demand, right? If there's a lot of those funds out there, then the Fed, if the supply of these funds is great, then the Fed funds rate will go down. If there's not such a supply, the rate will go up. Okay, now, this bank, though, that we're talking about, it wants money. It wants money coming in because it's going to loan that money out and earn interest. And we're going to talk about the other side of the bank's uh, balance sheet, its operations later. But these banks are all aggressive. They are making loans, and so they want more dollars to come in. And so some banks are very aggressive at going out there and finding those Fed funds. And some banks are borrowing billions of dollars in Fed funds every day. And in theory, they borrow a billion dollars and they say, I'll pay you back tomorrow. And in theory, all those banks that gave them a billion dollars could say, okay, it's tomorrow, I want it back. And then they would have to say, okay, how are you going to pay them back? Where do you come up with a billion dollars at a moment's notice? What would they do? And the answer is, they would probably go out and purchase Fed funds from other banks and say, here's your money back. But this is... This is uh, sort of the wholesale market for funds. And it's what's taking place behind the scenes. We see more of the deposits coming in, your checking deposit, your uh, savings deposit. This is the retail level. But there's this wholesale market. And there is a London interbank rate, LIBOR, an interest rate, if you've ever heard of LIBOR. And it is the equivalent of the Fed funds rate, but it's in this international financial market. It's a London interbank rate. It's being quoted all the time, too. Anyway, we don't need to get into that. Okay, questions about this? 
Here's another way to borrow from other, uh, well, another type of a loan. It's not very common, but we're talking about borrowing from the Fed. I talked about purchasing Fed funds a moment ago. That purchasing Fed funds is from another bank. This is borrowing from the Federal Reserve, and this is known as borrowing through the discount window. And that's what the term is, this discount window, of borrowing from the Federal Reserve. I'm going to borrow at the discount window. Okay. Now, the Federal Reserve, when it makes loans, typically it requires collateral, almost always requires collateral. And these tend to be short-term loans. You could pay one back. You could take out a discount loan today, not you, but a bank, and then pay it back tomorrow. But typically, these loans have got a maturity of a few weeks to a few months. And then there's an interest rate. What's the interest rate called? The discount rate. I told you earlier that I said earlier, and this would be a couple weeks ago, when we were doing a discount to present value, I said, we're going to use this term discount rate. It's that interest rate in the present value formula. And I use the term discount rate to apply to that. And I said later, we'll come back, use that term discount rate in a different way. It'll be for you to put things in context so you know which one of these rates we're talking about. Well, there was that rate we use for discounting future dollars to present value. And now we're talking about the discount rate. That is the rate the Federal Reserve sets on loans to banks. Okay. There are times when these discount loans are significant in amount. But we could just go for week after week, month after month, year after year, until some really difficult situation comes up in the economy. We could just go for weeks, months, years, and there would be almost no loans through the discount window of any size. Now, what does that mean? It, it would be big to you, right? a million dollars would be big to uh, most of us. But what I'm saying is this, is that we're talking about banks with trillions of dollars of funds coming in, and out of these trillions of dollars of funds coming in, I'm saying that $1 billion at, through the discount window will be a lot during normal times. And it would not be at all surprising to see something a tenth that, $100 million during normal times. So I'm just saying to you that even though I've got this list of borrowing from the Fed, that's not very common. This is borrowing from your regulator. This is like borrowing from your parents. And you know what your parents say if you want to borrow money? What are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to go to a party this week and get, you know, a case of beer and... No, you can't say that. You can't tell the truth. Well, when banks go to the Fed and say, I want to borrow, the Federal Reserve says, here's what they say, okay, here you go. And then the bank goes back in a week or a month and they say, I want to borrow, and they say, okay, here you go. And then you go back in a week or a month and say, I want to borrow, and they say, why don't you, you know what, just come on in and have a seat. We'll talk. Because we think we have some ideas for how you could manage your bank and you wouldn't be in here all the time. And so then what you start thinking is, you know what, I don't want to ever get to that third trip back to the Fed. And the way I avoid the third trip to the Fed is by avoiding the second one. And the way I avoid that one is by avoiding the first one. I'm not going to the Fed to borrow if I can help it. And then if something really comes up and it's really a challenging situation I face, I can go to the Fed and borrow and they're not going to be giving me this talk. They're going to be helpful to me. But I don't really want to go there very often if I can help it. And so there's not a lot of this borrowing at the Fed's discount window. The third place, and then and I won't give a full discussion, but I'll just add it to the list, and this is where we'll pick up next time, is from overseas 
Thanks. And the term that we apply to those dollars that are overseas are euro dollars. And we use that term even if they're not in Europe, if that makes any sense. Anyway, that's where we'll pick up next time. Next time we'll finish up talking about sources of funds for banks and try to turn our attention to the, uh, the uses of funds. So long. <laughs>